Good morning, folks on the West Coast. Good afternoon, folks in the middle of the country and further to the East. It is Printavo University, and we got a great one today. I am Nick from the sales team. You might know me if you bought Printavo. Maybe you bought it from me. I want to know who you are in the chat. Let us know who's watching today, huh? Where are you watching from? Tell us who's here, who's watching. We'd love to know. Uh, yeah, what up, Sam? Um, so, as always, I've got my lovely co-host here on the stream. Let me pass it over to our customer success hero. It's Matt Marcotte. What's up, Matt? Hey, hey. I don't know if I'd go by lovely. I'm not sure anything here screams lovely, um, but but thank you. That's, that's very, very kind on this, on this, this morning. Um, yeah. So guys, I'm really, really excited. We've got, uh, we've got our guest today, uh, Matthew Richardson of Relentless Merch. Um, this is somebody that I've, I really didn't actually have, have much knowledge about. I, I'd seen their shop and followed their shop. I didn't get a chance to really know Matthew until recently. Um, we're both on uh, the Gildan Board of Decorators, which is a cool, cool opportunity that we've both had to uh, kind of have some insight and talk with the, with the board. Uh, we've got somebody here from Threadbare Print House. Actually, uh, we had Amy from Threadbare Print House on recently, and she's also one of the board members on the Guild and Board of Decorators. So it's been uh, it's been fun for me to be able to, to chat with some folks I had admired from a distance and get to actually have some FaceTime, some conversation time. And during those calls, a few people have really, really, I mean, they've all stuck out to me. They're all great, great folks. I don't want to say the negative. I love them all. Um, but a few folks that really, really stood out to me that I was like, man, I think we're kind of a similar wavelength uh, was definitely Amy and then Matthew here. So uh, without any further ado, I want to introduce Matthew Richardson, Matt Richardson, but we're making these, we're calling him Matthew today because there's too many of us Matt's in this one call. So Matthew <laughs> Richardson. So what's, what's up, Matthew? How are you doing today? Great. I'm doing awesome. It's, uh, it's Thursday, I think. <laughs> um it's one yeah. of the, the short weeks always throw me off too and i was like what day is it i but yes confirmed it is thursday yeah no doubt i i did work monday just uh to play catch up but it didn't even feel like it because i wasn't answering as many emails and just doing other stuff so yeah love it love man. it love it let's do so the today folks we're we're, we're we're talking about uh Screen or not screen, we're talking about embroidery. We always talk about screen printing. So we're talking about embroidery. And this is one that we were stoked about. And and one thing that that we've kind of looked inside at ourselves here at Printavo is that I don't think we've always done the best job necessarily really talking and focusing on embroidery. We tend to get stuck up in this like screen printing world, and embroidery is a major, major, major part of the decorated apparel industry. Um, so this kind of seemed like a great opportunity to bring in an expert about embroidery and talk to and in full disclosure my shop that i'm at here simon fury we don't do embroidery we sent out for i got some great friends that do it for us i kind of want to get into it but i don't know if i do want to get into it or not because i don't know enough about the day-to-day -day with it. so i don't know about you folks that are here watching but i'm going to be taking notes learning from matthew as we go because i want to figure out if it's something that i should even dip dip my feet into so yeah take it away nick yes all right all things stitched. Let's start with the one we always start with. It's an easy one. Matthew, tell us about yourself, how you got into decorated apparel, and tell us about Relentless Merch. So uh, we started in 2012. My brother and I bought a Ryanet starter pack. Uh, just, you know, the, the one that everyone started with, I feel like it's a silver press. Um, I put it in my bedroom. We bought some, you know, tables from a local shop called Menards here, and and cobbled together this little starter pack. And, uh, and that was in 12. And, uh, he was in a band that played shows and we were in a small town. Um, and he was taking stuff. You might know like buckle, uh, like buckle stores. They actually had a screen printing shop in our, in our local community. Um, and we were taking stuff there and we were buying our own shirts and they were giving us contract printing pricing. And we we're like, ah, oh, man, this seems like a cool thing to get into. Uh, so we got into screen printing and we're goofing around with it, doing it in our basement. And it, it just kind of looked like something that I wanted to take more seriously and keep growing. And, and we kept growing. And I bought a house and, and uh, with a four-car garage. It was a tiny house, four-car garage. And, and uh, we started doing it out of there. And we bought our first embroidery machine uh, in 2014. And uh, it was just a single-head compact little dinky machine. And we uh we got that thing going and uh that's kind of how how it all started i i think that probably the first year i hardly used it um 
And in, uh, I think 15, we, uh, we decided that we were outgrowing the garage so quickly that we, uh, we moved out of the garage into a commercial space in a small town or a bigger city called Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, it's the capital city here in Nebraska, kind of on the Eastern side of the state. And, uh, from there we, we just keep growing and growing and, and that's how it all kind of played out. But yeah, it's, it's been a fun journey, no doubt. Absolutely. Now I'm curious. So it's sort of a direct follow up there. You mentioned you started with screen printing, but then in 2014 got the embroidery. It took a year to build up. Let's really dig deep. Like why did you guys start doing embroidery? And then tell us about that ramp up period, you know, from going to zero to actually implementing it into what the services you guys offer. It was a slow, it was a slower ramp up for us. Um, I, I bought uh, the SWF machine from our neighbor across the, the way. He, he had a little DTG shop slash embroidery shop, and he wanted to buy a different machine because SWF was supposedly going to go out of business or, you know, they stopped making them. I don't know. He was worried about them. They still make them today. I don't know what happened with that. But uh, we bought it for a, a deal. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we bought it. We put it in the shop. And we were like, ah, you know, figuring it all out. How to digitizing? What is that? You know, and all that. Uh, so I'd say the first good six months to a year, we barely touched the machine. Uh, and when we moved to Lincoln, um, it, it slowly, you know, we'd get a job here and there and I'd try and figure it out. And I, I would say that first year was just like kind of stumbling, trying to figure out how to sell embroidery. Um, we'd get a 20 piece beanie order or something like that. And just kind of, kind of work through figuring it out. And I would say until probably 16, we actually like, I started running the machine full time. Um, and I was like, that was all I did was sit in front of a single head who, you know, like over and over again. And, uh, you know, that, that's what, that's what kind of got us really going as soon as I had a full time role of just running embroidery. That's when, uh, the shop started selling more embroidery and feeling confident in selling embroidery and figuring out all the different, you know, processes to that whole thing. Just like screen, it's, it's a, it's a monster. It just keeps, you keep diving down further into it. So you had, I mean, I want to make sure my math is right here. You had three years of, of running a single head really, um, yeah. before you moved past that. So you had three years of like, that's like the equivalent of like printing on a, on a, on like a, a one station, right? Like maybe a four color, one station, silver, that silver, but like one, and then you got to do everything. And the nice thing is with the embroider, like you load it, it kind of does its thing for a minute or two, depending on how big it is. Well, you're, but you're still, you're hooping the next thing, right? You're getting ready for the next thing before you have to put that on too. It's not like you have to like sit and like, wait a minute. Like you're like, okay, it goes. And then you go do some more prep work. So you had three years of doing that. And it wasn't until you found yourself kind of like, shackled to that machine right where like right. that's all you can really do before you decided to to kind of up the ante and go with something that had a little bit a few more heads right so three years of really kind of test casing out the the how popular it's going to be before putting more money into it so yeah. i mean that seems like the smarter way to go for a lot of shops is like don't don't i mean if you get a six head but you're only running it an hour a day should you have gotten the six head, right? Maybe you should have like gotten the single head and like prepped for an hour of getting all those things, get a lot of hoops maybe. And then just kind of like swap them out as you're doing emails and other things. Is that what you, what you'd probably recommend to do to get started? Yeah. I think the single head's like a necessary, like learning process. We still have, we have two singles now and they're sample machines, you know, we're running samples on them. Um, and then, you know, just running the samples on that and running production on the sixes. Um, so, I think uh, though that process of starting with the single. After that, I bought a I bought a 1996 Tajima uh, two head, and uh, it was just an old machine, really crusty, you know. And uh, we had it rebuilt, and I ran that for a, a year until I hired someone. And uh, when we hired someone, we really realized that having machines that like are easy to work with for those customers is really important and or for the employee and uh you know the swf interface and the the tajima interface was just really hard to work together on so we uh we went ahead and uh sold those and bought a, a single head baritone 
which honestly the single head Baradin outran all three heads just because it's just a faster machine, less errors. It runs caps quick. Um, and it was just, it was, it was new and the interface was easy to run. So uh, with that, we, we grew really fast with that single head. And then we were able to, to justify buying a six when we were really moving some serious volume. So I, I got to ask, was your single head machine a three and a half inch floppy? Have you ever, have you seen yeah. those? I see a lot of, oh, yeah. a lot of shops that have the single head and they still have to have like an old computer or like a little like chip migrator that can like put their actual file on a three and a half inch floppy. It blows my mind when I go into these shops that are like state of the art, this, their art department's like all brand new Macs, Right. And then you get to the embroidery department and they got like this little tray full of floppy disks you're like what just happened is that, is that what you guys were rocking was a three and a half inch floppy yeah our tajima did floppy and uh usb or our, our floppy did uh our tajima did floppy disk and our uh our swf did floppy and usb so it was kind of it, it's like it's old technology but it still works great i don't i didn't have a problem with it um and uh yeah, and we just bought a Barrett in last winter just to kind of uh, – it was a 2001 forehead, and it ran a floppy disk, and it's it's totally fine. As long as it's a good machine, the floppy disk is irrelevant in my mind other than the fact that it's old tech. So Right, but you have to have a computer that you can actually like load a floppy disk into to load that file into, right? They make external floppy disk drives that are like 20 bucks on Amazon, and floppy disks are as cheap as they get. So honestly, Honestly, like if you found a old Baradin that had floppy or if a Kojima, um, depending on your preference, um, like that, that floppy machine or that, that still is decent technology. It still works, you know, because that, that's, exactly, that, that's, that's what I was hoping to find out. I was wanting to figure out like, Hey, if someone's coming across, like, like, like I said, I, I'm I'm very interested in possibly getting a single head here at the shop. And uh, I mean, you go on to all the different used markets and you can find it, but a lot of them, I see that three and a half inch floppy and I kind of go like, shit, <laughs> like, is that going to be a problem? Am I going to be okay here? Um, so that's, that's actually really good to know that like, as somebody who who ran a single head for three years, basically shackled to that thing, that didn't really <laughs> yeah. slow you down. So that, 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 that's what I was, I was definitely trying to, to, to look at is like, should we be concerned about that? Is it a little bit older tech and they don't have a USB option and all we have to do is get a three average floppy. Is it still worth it? Or is it now kind of like defunct? We shouldn't go that route. You're kind of saying get on Amazon. You can go ahead and get that floppy floppy disk external, load your file, take it over for, If you can get, get a good machine at a song that's a little bit older, you're saying it's still fine. It's okay to go with. I mean, 2001, our 2001 Baradin, I swear, like, so is just as good as our, our brand new 2018 Baradin. Like, it's, it's just a quality machine. Granted, you know, you get too old, you got to start worrying about like whether or not that you can get parts from it. I was told that Baradin got hit by a tsunami and, uh, years ago and lost all those old parts. So that's something you got to take into consideration when you're buying one of those older machines. Um, as far as Baradin goes. I don't know about other brands at, at this point. It's like, we're just so into Barrett and I, I, I can't tell you about what the new Tajima is doing or any, the, the Melco, like, you know, you can load off a computer. So that's kind of slick, but I think Barrett and the cap machine. And that's what we primarily do is caps. So that was our focus. And that's why we chose Barrett. And um, I know that there's other, you know, Tajima has got one out with like an adjustable presser foot and like different things like that. But uh, we chose Barrett and we've just been Barrett and, all the way since then. Love it. So, love it. Yeah. Now, Matt, you, or sorry, Matthew, you mentioned something a couple minutes ago that I wanted to dig in a little more on. You mentioned that it took a while to learn how to sell embroidery. Can you tell us more about that? Like, how did you learn how to sell embroidery? And now what do you think of as a good order? Like an order that you guys want to run? Um, right now we, Embroidery is like so seasonal. So right now, like we do a ton of caps. Um, you know, we have orders that are coming in that are 24 pieces and orders that we just implemented a 12 piece minimum on embroidery just because we were getting a lot of those small jobs uh, that were just kind of hard to navigate. Um, but 12 piece minimum and then we go up from there, but we have some 100 to, you know, 600 piece orders that are coming in 
uh, more frequently, which that six had just rammed through and it's, it's slick. Um, but yeah, I have two operators currently. Uh, we just hired another gal to help uh, those guys. And uh, we're really excited to kind of scale our embroidery operation a little more this year. Um, yeah, it's, it's fun. It's, it's a totally different beast. Uh, we're, we're so scaled on, on, uh, the screen side of things that, uh, we really needed another six head to keep up with everything that was coming to us. And, uh, we, we bought another six head and it was just delivered last week. So, yeah. I was watching, I was watching that on Instagram. You were, you were moving, moving that thing. Um, that was fun to see. I, I have a, I have a question if you don't mind me asking Matthew yeah. is what would you, what would you say currently is like your, your mix of work? Cause you don't just do embroidery. You also do screen. Um, mm -hmm. so what, what, what would you say is your, your blend of work? Like rough percentiles, totally fine. Like how much of your, of your work is actually embroidery? I would say we're like 70, 30, uh, 70 screen, 30% embroidery. Embroidery just takes longer. It's, it's definitely a, a more time consuming process and it, it just has its, uh, different navig like ways to navigate it. And yeah, it, those guys have been on embroidery side for two or three years now. And, uh, they're, that's their focus. And they, they, neither of them are, uh, screen guys. So that's, that's what they know. And they're, they're helping us with that side of the shop, which is really great. Is they there seasonality the at all? Does that ever, does that ever change? Right. A lot of people that I know that, that run into embroidery, like one nice thing is that when it gets cold, screen printing tends to kind of like peter out and you're in a place that gets a heck of a lot of snow and a heck of a lot of a lot of cold. Right. So yep. do you find, and maybe you don't, but do you find that maybe right now, warm season, it's a 70, 30. Does that ever shift when you get closer to like the winter months? Um, do you ever find that you start to have a little bit more uh, and possibly the embroidery, the, the ability to have the embroidery might actually help supplement some of the loss in the, the screen printing in that time of the year? Oh, no doubt. Yeah. The reason I bought this six head was this last month was I knew that they were going to be hard to get. I mean, I'm hearing m and super backed up. I just knew that, and it, it took us two months to get it. So um, if you're planning on gearing up for the, the holiday season, I'd get one order right now because they're, they're gonna, you know, I, yeah, ours came over on the boat and literally like was distributed to the customer immediately. And I'd be surprised if Baradon has any extra right now in stock in Ohio. So, and I don't know what other brands are dealing with, but I know that Baradon is having a hard time keeping up with the demand because uh, embroidery just keeps getting more popular too. The, the yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a big deal. Sorry, go ahead, Nick. Yeah, do you target the same customers for embroidery? Do you try to do it as an upsell to the jobs? Or do you, like Matt's saying, do you try to hit up the guys you talk to in the summer and the winter and say, hey, now it's time for hats? Or is it a totally different clientele? A lot of it is different clientele. Like you, we are getting more into the corporate level stuff and, and we're adding a lot of like tags to, you know, uh, garments with uh, like woven labels and different things like that. So we're seeing a lot of that. Um, so if there's some crossover, but there's also the ones that are just getting going to us for embroidery only. Um, it, it is, it's, it's super confusing. I, we have five sales staff here now and, and what everyone's selling to is kind of a different niche right now. Uh, we do chase the band market pretty hard, but we're, we're getting more into corporate stuff. So, and the embroidery sells super well to corporate clients, obviously. I see. Awesome. Awesome. And, and hey, folks, everybody knows we got a couple of people asking some good questions. Um, most kind of looking about what we're going to talk about the full thing. But if anybody has any questions while we're talking to, feel free to drop them in that questionnaire and we'll be sure to, to answer them um, as soon as we can, of course. Um, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Nick. Well, we, we've skirted around the issue a little bit. We've talked about equipment. We've talked about getting it in. I'm curious, what are the considerations that you went through, Matt, when you bought the new equipment you just bought? But also, what might be considerations people who don't have embroidery like our Matt, like Matt Marcotte, should be considering when he's starting up and buying that first single head? I, my biggest thing is, and obviously, like, I'm, everyone's got their brands, but uh, the SWF we had just really didn't run hats very smoothly. Maybe a different machine does that they make. It was just not cutting it. 
Um, I have friends seen people with the the Melco machines. I just don't think they're built as tough for caps. And I saw a Richardson cap, obviously the most popular cap on the market. And you look at their production floor and it's Baird and Tajima. And it just, it made sense. Baird and a little bit cheaper than Tajima and a bunch of my friends had Baird in. Um, so it just kind of was a no brainer support looked good. Um, they're not going to hold your hand. Like maybe a Melco will, if you're really diving in and just trying to get your feet wet with it. Um, I, I think that the Melco might be the way to go, uh, because it might be a little more intuitive. Um, but I'd say the Baird is a commercial machine for hats and that's the focus that they, they really focus on. Um, yeah. That, that's what one of the things um, we went with a compact to start out, just a compact single head Baird in. And it was just, it was like going from, it was, I compared it for going from uh, like a, a manual to an auto. And then, and then we got a six head and it was like, holy smokes, now we can really move some production. And I've seen people buy several singles, you know, it's all just what you're doing. If you're doing piece work, you know, like individual, a lot of individuals, like it helps to have a lot of singles. If you're doing big runs of 600 hats for, you know, the, the band that needs them, you know, then that obviously makes sense to have a six head. So everyone's got a different setup, you know? So I got, I got a, a question. So our last print top universe that we had, we had uh, uh, Corey Beal and we were talking about screen usage, right? And he was kind of diving into some fun ways to figure out like how many screens and of what mesh he actually needed to have. And he found a great way to track that and just kind of make it more predictable with your, with your press or with your, your, your embroidery machines, your presses, right? How many, how, how do you even know how to begin when it comes to like what hoops? Like if you know you're doing a lot of hats, a lot of hat hoops, right? But like, do you have like a gut feeling and just for your shop maybe of, mm -hmm. Hey, if I've got this many heads, I need to have this many hoops for this type of hoop. How do we even know to begin? Like, if you have a six head, should we get like 12 hat hoops and 12 left chest hoops and 12 full back hoops? Like, I'd assume like what you want to have a full, a full amount on the machine and you want to have at least, I'd assume, a full amount off to hoop while it's running, right? What, what, mm -hmm. what was your, what's your gut there? And what would you recommend to somebody who may be starting off um, with either a one head, six head, whatever, to kind of plan that way you're, you're utilizing your time the best? So Baird and they have like a special driver that's like made here in the U.S. I think it's like in New Jersey. It's called EFP that the company that makes it. And they send you the, the obviously the thing that mounts on the machine. And then they send you two for each head. You're going to get two standard hoops, like the, the ring style for each head. All those that we get, we end up putting up in the attic. Uh, my guys got it made. They got all the magnetic hoops. So we have the five, five, five magnetic mighty hoops for every two for every head of embroidery, which that gets really expensive. So that's something you really got to consider if you're, when you're getting into embroidery, how many of these do I need? I think those are like $150 a piece. It gets really expensive really quickly. Um, we might have some of the off brand uh, Chinese ones as well. And uh, they're not as strong if you're doing Carhartt, you know, but uh, the, the green ones are, are acceptable if you're doing uh, anything that's a lighter weight. They just don't have the strength that the mighty hoops are. Mighty hoops are nice. They're they're premium. Um, but yeah, uh, two hoops for every head is a given. We don't do extra. I think that that's you should slow your machine down to don't run to a red light is what the Barrett and Rep always said. So slow your machine down. Hoop. Go put it on the machine. Hit go and take time. Hoop you know, and then once that one's finished up, you should be done and ready to go again. Don't run your machine at a thousand, you know, 1500, uh, stitches per minute. If, if you don't really need to. And I, that's kind of what I've, I've lived by, uh, since he kind of told us that, but yeah, it's, uh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. So, so two of everything, right? So like two, if you, if you're doing hats, you need to have two. So if you have six head, you need to have 12 hat hoops if, if yep. you're right. So you need to have basically double whatever your machine can have for every style of hoop. So like you said, that, that can get expensive quick. And with those magnetic ones, my experience with those is also massive time savers, right? You're not having oh, to geez, finagle yeah. with the, the old one. So it, although they're, they're, they're not, not cheap, 
neither is time, right? Um, and neither is like messing it up, having to un- unconnect it and like reconnect them. So um, that's a that's a big, big, big. What was the name of that company again? So anybody who's watching that doesn't know it can can take a look at. They said Mighty Hoops. Yeah, Mighty Hoops Hoopmaster is the you got to have a Hoopmaster station. I guess like I probably should go into that, but like a hooping aid is absolutely essential. It, I've seen a lot of shops that don't have one. And, you know, yeah, you know, if you're, if you're trying to save money, by all means, you could probably get away with not having one, but having one will make more accuracy, especially when you're putting an employee in that place where you used to be having a hoop master just guarantees that those placements are going to be right. You can adjust them. You can, you can build like a, you know, a system and procedures. So then your employees know, oh, I need to be in this spot every time. And, uh, I think that, uh, I think that, you got to have a, a, a hoop, hooping aid of some sort, but a hoop master is what we have. And we have the, the mighty hoops as well. So to go with it. I, I got a question that just came out. I don't, I don't know we're here, but so you talked about like having an employer. So I was just, I was just picturing you. Um, like I was like literally picturing you shackled to this machine, the single head for three years, <laughs> like just how my brain works. Right. So the, the minute that you were able to kind of break that shackle and then bring somebody else to be shackled to it. Right. Um, how hard was that? Did you find that you were like, uh, like looking over the shoulder all the time? Be like, no, 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 don't do it like that. Um, how hard was that for you to let go? I mean, three years of you doing it, like that kind of becomes your baby a little bit, right? Like how hard, oh, yeah. it's a little bit off topic, but I'm just curious, like how hard was it? Not, not only like training them is one thing, training yourself is a whole nother thing, right? So h- yeah. how hard was that? What was that process like for you being the person that was doing it to having to let somebody else do it? The, the biggest thing that we really struggled with is uh, I, we hired a, uh, an employee to, to do it and having a 1996 Tajima, you know, those things are not the most intuitive machine, you know, they're, they're floppy disk, they're, you know, and, and it was worn out. This thing, uh, like, I think the Baradon rep came by and he was like, this was in like a prison in Kansas for years doing like state work. And he had sold the machine to the, the, you know, so it had so many miles on it. Um, so when you're buying a machine, like make sure it's, it's new enough that your employee is going to be able to learn it and run it every day. Um, it's no different than a screen machine. You know, if you're, if we bought the 2001 gauntlet, you know, teaching the employee how to run that interface versus the 2019 sportsman is just it's a struggle you know they just make them easier to run today because technology is advanced um so yeah i think that was the biggest learning curve is buying the better machine so then she could uh help grow our embroidery business and she did she helped grow it from a single head to we had to buy a six because we were not being able to keep up and uh yeah uh no doubt that was that was a that was a massive leap in a forward direction although uh, you know, the six had the payment on the thing is like $900 a month, you know, it's expensive. So you got to be turning some serious numbers to, to justify. And if you can, you know, by used, by a used Barrett and you might be in a, a better position and used to Jima. If it's, you know, newer that 96, I wouldn't recommend buying something built in the nineties by Tajima. Um, but I haven't owned every one of those, but that's my experience. Gotcha. That's out. So I got a couple questions from uh, the watchers that I want to make sure we get to. Um, I'm sorry. I'm going to probably butcher some last names here, guys. Don't hate me. Um, Sam Keese had a question uh, saying, do you use any tension gauges for your machine, either a bobbin or top tension? Um, when you answer that, can you also let the layman's know what the hell she's talking about? So uh, the, the he, first he or she actually that... don't know what he or she. Sorry, Sam. Sam could be a he or she. Sorry. The, they're talking about. Sam's on the right track though. Uh, those are the most important things when you're setting up an embroidery machine. Um, you know, having, I think it's to- Toa. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but Toa gauge, which is your Bob intention gauge. Um, the, that's the first thing I train on when we get a new person. I just did it like a week ago. And, uh, mm-hmm. that, that, that gauge sets your tension for the bobbin, which is what decides, if you're getting bobbin in your design, if you ever see a embroidery that has white bobbin in the design, it's because it's coming up from the bottom. It's basically what creates the knot. Um, so yeah, top tension gauge is a Tajima gauge. It's like long like this, it's like a pencil and you can pull it and you got to set your top tension. And then the Toa gauge, 
which has a bobbin case in it. Don't go through the pigtail, come around the gauge, but don't go through the pigtail on a toe gauge. I learned the hard way on that for years. Um, yeah, we always buy magnetic bobbins um, just because then I know which side they go in um, and get a small business card and clean that clip in that bobbin case, the case that holds the bobbin. You want to clean that like almost every time you change the bobbin because lint gets built up in there if you buy the cheap bobbins like we do and uh, sets your tension all out of whack. And you can retension, but it might be jumpy. So clean that, clean that case like frequently. Um, those are the two things that I go over like Im immediately when we have somebody training in embroidery. That's awesome. That's, I think it's exactly what we're looking for. So Sam is typing. Yeah. Uh, I'll see what Sam, um, perfect. L loved it. All right. I got another question from knock Fox. Um, so knock is asking, does Matt have any tip on embroidery on six panel caps is the key in digitizing or backing or hooping having a struggle at the moment with six panels? Uh, six panels are very, very popular. So I'm sure there's a lot of folks that might be having similar issues like knock is having here. Um, any, any insight? I, I, we pulled our hair out, like with the SWF trying to figure out, Oh, this seam down the center, you know, like what, what's the deal with that? Like, why can't we sew through that? Got a bear it in and we use a piece of 2.5 cap, uh, backing tear away and it's it just slams through them and there's literally nothing and I for years blamed myself or what we were doing but the machine is machine and embroidery is so important it's just it's not like screen you could make you know a uh, you know the the cheesy automatic screen printing press print the same quality as maybe a like higher end model but with embroidery, you know, that 96 Tajima that was worn out or, you know, isn't going to do the quality. It did go through the seams, no problem, but it doesn't do the quality or accuracy that my Baradin, even my 2001 Baradin did. Um, just because it was worn out and old, maybe, maybe because Baradin had the edge there. I'm not sure, but I, I couldn't say that maybe it is a little bit your machine. That's what I would probably point at. I don't know what you're running. Uh, that would help. But yeah, I think machine's really important. If it's Japanese made, happy, uh, Tajima, uh, Baradin, you know, or ZSKs, I think it's a great one. Um, but if it's made in China or maybe Korea, like SWF, Advanced, you know, those machines are cheaper for a reason. Rakoma, but I know people do have good luck with them. If you can figure out how to make that machine make you just as much money as mine, by all means, that's awesome. I just, I don't know. And I don't have a ton of experience with those, but our SWF did not do caps worth the crap. Good to know. These are great tips. Matthew, I'm wondering what are some on the same theme? What are some of the hard lessons you've learned running embroidery orders these past seven years? Like what are some mistakes you've made that you could tell us about so other people don't make them? Get a good digitizer. Uh, that's really a good digitizing service. Um, it'll be our old. Yeah. So yeah, that that creates some problems. Uh, the Shimas, they're they're a great machine, especially the older ones. You know, they were built well. They just they aren't the technology that we have today. Um, jumping back to Knox' uh, comment there. Uh, but what was your question again? Sorry, I got I got sidetracked. No worries. Yeah. What are just some some hard lessons you've learned that you could tell us about so we don't make the same mistakes? You know, you buy that starter machine for four or five thousand dollars. You actually might be better off buying the the newer Baradin because you're gonna if you have the orders, you're gonna have so much easier running that machine than than messing with the old, you know, machine that somebody else put out to pasture for a reason, you know. It's it's just what it is. Um, I think that I would recommend spending good money on a machine and investing in yourself. And that goes with pretty much anything in this industry. You know, if, if you see orders coming in the door and you can justify buying a better piece of machinery, it just makes sense. So do you have any, do, do you, if you think back, like, was there ever like a shit type moment that you were that you dealt with with any of your embroidered machines Any, anything like maybe you like bit off more than you could chew you're in over your head or like 
you were like, yeah, we can totally do that. And then when it came down to brass tacks, you're like, oh, we're not doing this well. Uh, any, anything like that that kind of comes up in your mind that you want to share? We just did a, a 500 piece uh, order for uh, flat bills and it was puffy foam and it was uh, metallic gold thread. And uh, we found a gold thread that was strong enough to do it. And uh, it's called Kingstar, if anyone needs that info. But Kingstar thread is super strong. Their metallic thread's the best um, I've ever used. Maybe there's something better out there, but it's insane. Um, but Kingstar and then Puffy Foam, we use Gunold, uh, that dense foam that they sell. Gunold, we use Gunold just for their foam. I swear they have the best foam on the market. Um, but that combo... Got those hats done, but oh my gosh, was it a time-consuming endeavor. Uh, we'd have a thread break, you know, every, uh, I'd say like, you know, minute or two. And we got through them, but it took two operators just kind of going back and forth, fixing thread breaks and, uh, you know, getting it dialed. And oh man, it was, it, it was a beast. Well, next time we'll uh, sell them out to be cut and sew, I think. That, uh, that, that, that's exactly what I was looking for. Yeah. So, uh, Sam's got another question. He's asking, uh, do you have any rules of thumb for weight for what, sorry, for what weight or style of stabilizer to use for different garments? And again, let us screen nerds that don't know what he's talking about. Give us some insight as to why that matters. So we use bear, or, uh, Madeira thread. We're all Madeira thread. We use Madeira backing too. Um, we use a ton of, they have like, oh, they have like, I think it's a 2.5. And then there's a, there's another one. Uh, always send me an, a message on Instagram and I can look, but there's two of them that we use primarily. They also have what I call a grid system um, for those like uh, polyester uh, polos that like to scrunch up, but it's performance in the middle. So we'll put the soft uh, backing on the outside, the grid or performance in the inside. And then your shirt, obviously here. Um, and I think that helps stabilize those really strong. So they, they don't end up wavy in the wash machine. Um, and that, that really has helped a ton. Uh, but yeah, get with Gunold or Madeira or, you know, your supplier and, and they'll tell you, you know, what people are primarily using. Um, we just kind of went Madeira and never really looked back. I haven't considered anything else. Once you get enough cones of thread, you're just like invested. Love it. Love yeah. it. Cool. Awesome. Th good question, Sam. Thank you. I have one, guys. We've also kind of been alluding to it, but I'm going to just ask it plainly. Why do you think, Matthew, why do you think some shops just say, I'm not doing it? I don't do embroidery. I sub it out. Why do you think that? Uh, what, what do you they're tired of their fingers bleeding from stabbing <laughs> themselves with needles. That's, that's why I'm scared of it. It's sharp Your things in eyes. Needles is that. <laughs> It's so tough. I've never contracted an embroidery job out, period. Like we've never sent something out. Um, I know that like when you get those big piece orders, it's, it's just like, eh, I'd rather make the money and not have to hire an employee for that one job, you know? And I, I understand that theory. You know, we were a contract shop up until May and today we helped, it helped us scale, you know, it helped us get to where we're at. But today we're just absolutely, we can't even keep up with what we have. So I think being a contract shop created that avenue of workflow and then we cut it off and now we're, we're fully doing just our own. And uh, I think that subbing stuff out just totally makes sense. It's a, uh, it's a necessary thing that you sometimes you have to do. We're at this point, we're, we're subbing out uh, screen printing jobs um, just to keep up because we just can't keep up with our two presses. Um, but yeah, contract, all the way, you know, there's plenty of great contractors. The only thing is I'd find a contractor that you know is running a, a good Tajima or Baradin that's new enough that's gonna do quality work. If you're sending it to the, like someone that's running a 96 crusty Tajima, eh, you know, it's not gonna stitch out as nicely and they they might not value your work as much as the, the guy that's bringing them hundreds of thousand dollars a year. So they might put your stuff on that old Tajima and it might not look as good, so. My recommendation is, uh, you know, if you got a contract out, that's the, that's the necessary thing. You know, it, it's less risk, you know, you don't have a two, 
$900 a month uh, embroidery machine payment. So that, that's, that's why I don't do it yet. And it's one of those things where it's, I'm, I've, I've been screen printing since I was 12, right? I'm 34 now. So we talked about it earlier. So uh, I just, it, it's, it's feels like second nature. I feel very confident that if a print doesn't look how it needs to look, I can look at the print and figure out where it went wrong, address that variable, fix it and get going and run. Right. I don't feel that confidence with embroidery because although I've run shops that had, I ran a shop for many years that had four days embroidery, but I had folks that were embroidery experts running those departments. They just reported to me for what I needed to know and I helped schedule things, right? I didn't have to be the technical person. And even when you're usually a shop owner, you don't need to be a technical person when it comes to screen printing necessarily either. It just happens to be that I am the technical person for screen printing. So yeah. I've kind of stayed away from embroidery because it's, it's out of my comfort level. Um, which sounds really lazy and like a, a cheap answer, but it's the truth. And I think a lot of shops that I talk to, they kind of feel similarly. They, they might've like jumped in without the screen printing back on the guy had. Right. And they already had to go uphill with the, the learning, the variables to figure out how to like even survive. And the idea of like bringing in another opportunity to have that like monster uh, monster stone to push uphill before you start to see the sun with it is terrifying so I've defaulted to who do I know in the industry that has, has, has embroidery and a lot of people, right? And I've got some close friends that, that do really good work. And so I've outsourced, but at the same time, I'm at my shop going like, man, I wish I could like just throw a hat on to an embroidery machine right now and like make some sweet shit. Right. And like, maybe, maybe it's not so much like I need to like get into it just to supplement my, my, the income, right. Or supplement the, the work, but maybe something that like I want to expand, like the idea of me being able to do embroidery. I like that idea. I'm terrified of what I don't know, right? So I think that, like you're saying, like, look, if you if you want to offer it and you just don't have time to learn, contract it out. Find a good shop. You had some really, really good tips that I hope everybody noticed there, too, of like, hey, probably look for a shop that you trust and has newer equipment, right? Don't yeah. go with the old guy. Like, if, you, if I go to a shop, like, I mean, my manual press here is, like, 25 years old. It's fine. Doesn't matter. Even if this was an automatic and it's 25 years old, it's one of the good manufacturers, which most of them are good. There's a couple that I don't like, but most of them are pretty, pretty damn good. <laughs> yeah. Like, you, like you said, in most instances, you can get within the same margin of error on quality. Now, not as quickly, not as efficiently, but the same margin of error quality. That's not the case. It sounds like with the embroidery machines, and that's that's a very unique variable. It's that's different to to embroidery. Like you said, it might not be able to actually get to the seams. Might not be able to to do the different different shapes. So big big thing to look for so somebody you trust somebody who puts out good quality and somebody who has probably it sounds like if you're with in your in your opinion if you're with Bairdon or Tajima and you're within the last like 15 20 years you're probably okay um yeah outside of that you're kind of like I'd, I'd be cautious or at least conscientious about that choice maybe some sample orders over first um to kind of get that contract so you also mentioned a minute ago that you stopped doing contract work um, all together, uh, and stuff like yeah. that was just because you didn't have the time for it. Um, was it a was it just the time, or did you find that like, look, I can go get sales and not have to compete with the margin they have to take out for contract, mm -hmm. or was it a mixture of both? What was the what was the the full driving factor there, and what have you found in 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 cutting your contract out? Yeah, cutting contract in in May really like it, it just it helped us able to focus on our core customers and making sure that we're able to keep up with their stuff and making them happy. You know, I, it, you could be contract work is great. And if you need it to scale, like go talk to your local screen shops that are like Matt that don't have the ability to do that. You know, you could, you can scale your operation doing that, but at some point, you know, nobody wants to have six or seven autos. Like I don't, I don't have that interest. Like I want to, I want to have four maybe and like, you know, maybe 20 heads of embroidery and like it all be our own and make the, the full margin on it. It's just, there's so much work in the world that like, you just, you don't want it all. You just want a mm -hmm. piece of the pie. And that's all I really want at this point. I just want to do the stuff that we want to do. Um, and uh, yeah, it, but not, not to say contract shops, like almost, I'd almost recommend if you're going to go full contract and that's really your contract, you're going to be a contractor or you're going to be a, you know, uh, a person that's uh, sell, like selling the job, you know, and, and that whole beast is, it's a whole nother 
ball game in my mind, but we just, we weren't doing well at being both. And especially when we're stepping on our, our uh, contractors toes occasionally in the local area or whatever it is, it was just a conflict of interest um, there. And then, you know, people not paying on time, you know, the, the, it, it, there's a variable there that, you know, I don't want to have to be a bill collector. And I'm, I, at this point with Printavo, we're a hundred percent down payments um, unless it's like a government entity. And uh, that's something that was pushed to us in 2020 when we switched to Printavo. And I think that it really helped us able to cash flow and, and really helped us grow our business uh, organically rather than trying to get it through other people and, you know, trying to work around all these other systems like QuickBooks direct and, and like all our Excel spreadsheets, not to say like that has, its you know, advantage price wise, but the, the $300 a month we pay in Printavo is worth every penny because it, it really helps us be able to flow through the shop more and I can focus on selling and not have to go answer a million questions. Uh, to all the sales staff or all the production staff. So, love it, there's, love it. There's awesome. My thing. Let me ask a related question here. So, Matthew, when you guys were taking contract jobs, we have I, we have folks in Washington. I bet are going to start contracting on a brewery. What is the way to send over a job to a contractor to make them super happy? What do they need to send to you, the contractor in this case, to make you go, "Wow, I love working with this dude. I'm going to print his stuff every time, and I'm going to print it on the good the good machine." Yeah, so, yeah. What, what what would you say is the best practice for that? I think getting a thread guide, like get a Madeira thread guide or whatever you know, thread brand that your contractor's using, work with your clients and figure out that, you know, the working with your clients is such a big part of the piece, you know, the, the puzzle, like, you know, that in itself is like just as hard as like printing the jobs. A lot of the times, uh, sometimes, you know, you get those easy customers, but um, work with them, get thread colors really set in stone um, and, and build proper mock-ups for them and your production you know, that, that's definitely a hurdle around here is just making sure that our production has mock-ups that are, that are really specced out really nicely and giving your contractor that kind of stuff and writing the POs really nicely with pieces, you know, exactly colors of, and the skew or the skews that you're using, you know, providing, you know, for any of your, in your, any of your decorators, if you're ordering, you know, mugs or whatever it is, you know, you really need to make sure that they have everything they need to do to do the job correctly rather than having to eat it or biff it. So now when you, when you were contracting, were you doing so outs for, for those customers? And would you recommend that anybody that's looking for a contractor to require so outs? I, we never did. So outs. uh, we do occasionally for hard to work with clients on the, our sales side, but most of the time contract was, it was pretty cut and dry, you know, and, it, it definitely wasn't dialed to the level that a real contract, a real contract like St. Louis embroidery or something like that really dials their stuff. Um, I think that there's some massive contract embroidery shops that are going to expect real specifics from you. Um, right now we're contracting out our screen jobs to a good friend of ours in Omaha. And, you know, like he is, he, we send him specs that are really like close, but it's not still not as good as, you probably should to like, you know, a big shop, like, you know, same day teas in Chicago or something like that. So, Perfect. yeah. Let, a related question. You don't have to tell us the exact details, but what do you guys consider when you're pricing out an embroidery job? What are the variables that make it cost more and, and what are you charging for? Stitch count, you know, uh, is something to take into consideration. We don't always do the best. We just kind of price high and that's what it is. Um, or at least what we think is high. Um, you know, a left chest is normally 5,000 stitches. Sometimes it's more though. Um, if it comes back more, sometimes we'll have to, you know, talk about that with the client, but most of the time they're five, six, I think our start starts at 6,000, uh, stitches. And, uh, that's kind of how we price it. Um, yeah, it's pricing embroidery has never been. It's it's tough. It's a it's a monster in itself, no doubt. Uh, so this would be a dumb question. 
a lot, a lot. I don't I hate to interrupt you, but a lot of folks, I get this a lot with Printob. I'm sure, I'm sure Nick does too. People ask me all the time, "Hey, is my pricing good?" And I can't answer that, right? Because it's a complimentary. I'm looking at thousands of, pe of people's pricing. I can't tell, give insight to that. So I always give people uh, there's there's kind of two answers. There's like the the real way to do it. And there's the way most people actually do it. The real way to do it is figure out your entire overhead cost and then how many shirts you've produced in, in, in a given time. And then you figure out how much it actually costs you to decorate one shirt, right? And then you figure out that mark of what you want to grow into and you add your margin to there. That's hard to do, especially if you're brand new and you don't have data to collect of how many, like I didn't have a six month period where I can look at what I've actually printed. I didn't have pricing yet. I'm still new. So the other answer, which is the, the wrong answer, what a lot of people do though, and it's kind of hard to tell you not to if you're new, is go look at your competition locally, kind of average the pricing out, put a price list together temporarily, test that out, see how it goes for you, and then alter as you need. Do you have any kind of insight um, to somebody who maybe I decide I, I'm, I'm going to go get a single head Barrett and uh, I got the, I got the Matthew Richardson bug. bug. I, I got to get a Barrett. I'm going to let Barrett know, try to get a discount, make sure he gets some credit too for it. Right. Ooh, hey, and yeah. I want to okay. go, let, let's, let's exactly right. Let's, let's get, uh, let's get to do some embroidery. How do I price this right now? I don't want you to give, give your pricing away. You spent lots of time shafting right. to the machine, oh. figuring out what, what to price, <laughs> but do you have any, any kind of, any kind of like low hanging fruit insight to somebody that just doesn't know where to start? I'd say we did it the wrong way, you know, uh, you know, uh, your competitors decide your market value. And sometimes that's just the na nature of the beast. Um, if you're, if you're working on a local scale, if you're, if you're, if you're just Lincoln, Nebraska, you know, your competitors are what people are paying in that local area. Granted, I have people that balk and go away, you know, because we're too high, but it, it really is like those clients are sometimes the ones you don't even want. Um, but I think that, looking at what your local competitors charging isn't, isn't a bad idea because that is what you're they're getting. And it, it, no one really knows. Uh, another good way to do is get your contract contractor uh, that is doing your embroidery and look at their price guide and mark it up 40% or 50 or 60%, you know, um, margin, you know, I, it, it's just kind of like, you know, you just got to make money on it. Um, and if, if you get, too many no's, then you have a problem. But if you're getting constantly yeses, that means that your pricing is probably too low. So that's that's normally the nature of what we see. And we need to get more no's at our shop. We we definitely need to hear more no's than we hear yeses, and we're getting way too many yeses. So we probably need to move our pricing up. But pricing structure is a monster. I don't I don't have a good answer for that. No man, that, that was really, a good, that, that was a good answer. That's a real that's a really good easy evaluative metric. Are you hearing yes to every quote you send out? Okay, it's too low. No is good. Embrace the no. We say that you need like a no or two a month. You know, if you hear no, you're you're doing something right, in my mind, because there's a lot of people that are gonna go to the cheap place, and I don't want to be the cheapest one on the market. You know, that that just is a. Uh, I want to be moderately priced. You know, a fair fair deal. Absolutely. Uh, we are closing in on our time, but I got two good ones left for you. So okay. you mentioned this one earlier, Matthew, digitizing. Do you guys do it in-house? Do you contract it out? Uh, do you have software that you use when you get the file back? Is it is it ready to stitch right when you get it back? Tell us about your digitizing process and any tips you have to make it easier for people getting in the space. Or do you uh, just answer all the Instagram and Facebook messages that are constantly bombarding you and throw work to them? Cause I get like four a day and I don't even do embroidery. <laughs> you could, yeah, I mean, if they're good, the, the thing is like there's auto digitizing. So there's people that are going to automatically just like press a button. It's going to digitize it. And, or even do a combo of auto digitizing mixed with uh, traditional, like mapping it out. Um, we do a little bit of digitizing in house, like patch placements and stuff like that. We'll do. Um, you know, anything like just standard, I just sub it out. Um, there's plenty of great vendors out there. Like, you know, you can get on the embroidery life, ask that question uh, on Facebook. And, you know, I guarantee you're going to get Vitter's name a million times. He's ex excellent. Uh, but there's a million people just like him that do great work. Um, Vitter's excellent. Uh, you know, and he's a real person you can talk to. Having that real connection is, is kind of nice when you got something that's a little more difficult. 
maybe you're doing a big back embroidery. Um, that's crazy that I just had him do and a, a, he'll, he's excited to do that kind of thing. And, uh, those are always fun. Um, but yeah, I, uh, but do you, do you maybe, need to have software in, in house to be able to like edit things? Like if you get it and you're like, you know what, this, this, this jump stitch here, or I, I don't like this satin stitch here. Like, do you, do you need, or do you recommend to have the software in house and like, kind of get the basics like maybe you don't need to be like with screen printing maybe you don't need to like know how to like vectorize a sim process job but you need to be able to go in and like add some font add a text or like change something would you kind of say like hey if you're gonna get into embroidery you should probably also start dipping your toes into learning a little bit at least about some of that digitizing software yeah absolutely i think uh there's some basic levels of wilcom wilcom's kind of the big one uh, as anyone would know, um, unless you're running Pulse or uh, the Melco product. Um, but Wilcom has like the elite one. Um, it's insanely expensive, but there's like an entry level hatch and uh, it'll get your custom names when you have people wanting name drops. Um, and it'll have uh, the ability to edit those stitch out. So that's, that's what we, we've used for years and it, it works. It would be nice to have something a little more extreme, but man like two or three grand for e3 or e4 or whatever they're on Oof, it's expensive we'll probably end up getting it in the next year or so just because we'd like to do more um complex stuff or do our own stuff but hatch does a lot i mean it's it's pretty intense uh for your entry level stuff so perfect that's a, a lot of great tips i got i think our funnest question for last is there any jobs that stick out to you that you're really proud of um, or that you guys did special effects on? I, you mentioned earlier the one with the metallic thread, but do you have any pieces that just stick out in your head as like, man, I'm really proud of that one, or even something to show up to the webcam? Yeah, uh, I, I didn't bring – you know, we're doing a lot of patches, uh, patches sewn on, and uh, creating those sew files is kind of fun. But, uh, yeah, we – we do a lot of wovens, which would be like a tag label. Um, and then we do a lot of uh, ones with like an overlock border, like an edge border like that. You know, it's nicely finished. It's got heat press backing back here. Um, and then we do some of the PVC patches for like really fine detailed stuff. And that that stuff is pretty cool. Um, we're getting a lot of requests for that. So. I feel like patches are definitely are making a big, like a big, I don't know if I can say a comeback, but kind of a comeback, right? They were like huge yeah. in like the eighties. Um, they never fully went away, but like they are back and, and back pretty, pretty hard. So that, that's awesome. So you're able to do the patches uh, on, on your machines then. Is that correct? Or are you setting out for those? Uh, we, we get the patches made overseas because that's where everyone's getting them. And then, uh, and then we stitch them on, uh, build the sew file and everything. So, yeah, uh, I know there's a ton of, uh, the embroidery life's a great resource. There's a guy on there that'll show you how to, how to do it. Uh, I'm kind of crazy. I don't believe that you can really like get away with uh, making patches with just your embroidery machine. I think you need that like overlock border to really finish the patch correctly. Um, I mean, you can, but I just think that that like is such a cleaner look. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, going to the embroidery life and, and really asking that question uh, is there's there's plenty of resources on there showing how to how to set up and that's how we learn. Cool. I love it. I want I want to mention something too. Uh, we had somebody in the comments, uh, Rosemary, uh, mentioned that there's somebody known as uh, is her, her name's Joyce Jagger. She's known as the embroidery coach. She also recommends her a lot when it comes to folks maybe help oh, yeah. and help looking for how to price things out. Um, so uh, Matthew's mentioned the embroidery life. It sounds like a Facebook group. Um, and then uh, Rosemary mentioned uh, Joyce Jagger, known as the embroidery coach. So um, definitely, definitely great places to go. Um, I'm also pretty sure that if you have any questions for Matt, you can probably hit him up on the Instagrams, uh, right? So just Relentless Merch is, is the Instagram over there. I follow you guys. And um, it, it's, I mean, the last week after after we kind of chatted, I, I kind of went through and creeped out your page for a while. And uh, good content, fun to see what you all are doing. And also kind of gave me that 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 embroidery itch. So I definitely recommend everybody goes and follows Relentless Merch. If you're not already, you're missing out, go check it out. Um, yeah. Awesome, awesome. This was this was great. Any any last words of advice or input you want to give to the to the crew? Uh, not the one thing I'd like to say is like follow us on Instagram. Uh, chat me up. I'm the one that runs the conversation most of the time. So 
I'm going to answer your question or, you know, uh, we're getting ready to drop a, like a, a cap uh, company here in the next year. Um, so follow us there. It'll be kind of a uh, more hipster geared hat, you know, with the rope and the, the five panel and different things like that. Kind of your Richardson grandpa cap, but maybe at a little lower cost. Um, you know, so that's, that's what we're going for. Uh, but that'll drop probably in the next year uh, with a Shopify and everything. So we're excited about that. That's awesome. So follow us for that. I got a quick question for Printavo, Matt, Matt Marka. After everything you heard today, Matt, do you think you're going to get a single head? Do you think you're going to embark on it? Or do you think you're going to stick with contract? I think we're going to have to do it. The only thing is we might be having to force move out of here. We got a new landlord and it's a little bit iffy. So uh, that's the only thing that's up in the air. So once we get that kind of settled out, if we have to move and do a whole bunch, that's going to be a bigger, bigger expense. Um, but I, I got to do it. So I, I have a feeling that in the next six to eight months, I'm going to end up with a single head in here or wherever I'm at. And Matthew's going to get real tired of me hitting him up for input advice nonstop. He's going to, he's going to regret okay. this. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I got, I got the bug. So I, 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 I got to do it. I got to get it to do it. So I'm excited to learn more, uh, prick my fingers a little bit and then call, call you crying, Matthew. So it'll be, it'll be fun. Sounds good. Well, this is super great talking guys. Uh, thank you so much, Matthew. So much amazing knowledge. You guys thank can you. watch a replay of this right at this link, right when it's done, we put them on YouTube too. So watch them there. We got another one coming up in two weeks here. Uh, and you know, we're, you sign up for the, the, go register for it when it's live. It'll give you all those, uh, what's it called? Those notifications. But otherwise everybody, uh, thank you so much for coming to watch this. And of course, thank you, Matthew at Relentless. And thank you, Matt at Printavo. I'm Nick at Printavo and I will be seeing you next time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody. Thanks.